Hey, Vibrant. It's good to see you. It's so good to be together, isn't it? Uh, welcome to our middle schoolers in the room. What's up? Woo -woo! All right. Love seeing that home select like middle schoolers come in today. It's super cool. Hey, uh, there's a pool in the room. Have you seen this? <laughs> Can't really miss it. I hear one of my friends like, jump in. I thought about it earnestly. Like, I'm like, what would happen if I just did a cannonball right from here? <laughs> what could go wrong? Uh, <laughs> the safety, safety team's in the back like, please no, please no, please no. Uh, hey, I'm so glad you're here. Today is Baptism Day. I don't know if you heard, Baptism Sunday. And uh, we have, I know, yeah, we can celebrate it. So coming into today, we have nine folks that have said, yes, we're going to go in and be baptized today. And my expectation and my anticipation is we're going to have some folks in the room today that are also going to say yes beyond those nine folks uh, to going all in and identifying themselves with Jesus. We, we celebrate baptisms uh, all the time around here. We do baptisms every week, but it is fun one time a year to put an extra emphasis on baptism where we encourage people to spontaneously make the decision to go all in with Jesus, like on the spot. No class, no training, nothing. We just want you to say yes and to go all in. And so uh, we'll talk more about that here in just a little bit, but my encouragement to you would be, if you feel that nudge or that prompt to get in the water and identify yourself with Jesus today, may you say yes to that obedient move, amen? So may you say yes to that. Hey, uh, I'm really excited to uh, dive into the text today. Uh, today, oh, I wanna mention our friends online. Hey, friends online. Uh, if you are inclined to be baptized today, get on site we would love to uh, host you and facilitate that with you. Um, but if you have trouble getting here today for a variety of reasons, or maybe you live far, far away, shoot me a note. Um, we'll fly to you or we'll fly you to us. We'll figure it out. We just want to celebrate that identifying with Jesus and the new life that we can have in him together. So we love you online, fam. So make sure you're jumped in with us uh, today. Hey, uh, we're in the series of John. What's crazy is uh, we're about to finish this book of the Bible. Isn't that incredible? Like we've almost worked through this entire biography of Jesus and we're coming into the final chapter today. It's kind of sad. Everybody say, aw. But if you were here last week, you know that we've got good news today, don't we? That the cross is empty, the tomb is empty, Jesus is alive, amen? And if Jesus is alive, that means anything is possible. So to, the title today is uh, really simple. It's just called The Empty Tomb. And we're gonna go from chapter 19, uh, the end of chapter 19 through the start of chapter 20. So if you've got a Bible, go ahead and go there with me. Um, now, I'm a big biography guy. I don't know if you're a biography fan. Um, I, I love to read biographies. Uh, I've recently read a Vince Lombardi biography. I've got a James Garfield biography sitting on my shelf right now. And uh, spoiler alert, do you know how most biographies end? At, at the person's passing, right? Uh, at their death. And what's unique about Jesus is his biography that we have in the book of John, uh, it doesn't end, does it? Like where most biographies and stories of a person's life end, Jesus's life does, uh, the biography does not end because there's life beyond the grave for Jesus. Um, and and even, even like if you wanted to go honor uh, like a famous figure or something like that, you could go see where they're buried, can't you? Like, I, I went and saw where Elvis is buried. Uh, help me understand, where, where, is, where is Elvis buried? Graceland, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you, if you show up at Graceland, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see him there. Uh, if you uh, wanna go see Abraham Lincoln, you're gonna go to my hometown of Springfield, Illinois, shout out, woo woo, and you can see where he <laughs> is buried. My wife and I were in New York City, and she has become just enraptured with the musical Hamilton. I don't know if any other Hamilton fans in the room, but we went to Lower Manhattan uh, and saw where Alexander Hamilton was buried. Um, and even beyond famous figures or political figures, uh, you consider famous religious figures. Uh, Abraham, for our Jewish friends, he's buried in Hebron, and you can, you can go see where he's buried. Uh, the Buddha, you can see Buddha where he's buried in India. Muhammad, you could see him buried in Saudi Arabia. But Jesus... If you were going to go pay your respects to where Jesus is buried, where are you going to 
Where are you going to go? You're going to turn up empty because ultimately the grave is empty. And what's significant about our Jesus, our um, giver of life and the purpose and the joy and the grace that he extends to us is it doesn't end in a tomb. And what that means then for you and for me is that the resurrection of Jesus means that also that can be our story too. That his resurrection story can become our story as well. That death in this life does not have to have the final say so. And that's good news for you and for me, friend. It's that the pains of this life, the hurts of this life, the loss of this life does not get the final word. That we can have eternity and life with Jesus forever, amen? And so this resurrection story, friend, it's the foundation of all that we are and all that we do. So let's go to John's biography with Jesus. Um, We're in chapter 19 and we're gonna get ahead to uh, chapter 20 as well. Here we go starting in verse 38. Later, Joseph. Everybody say, Joseph. Now, uh, you may get your characters confused. This is not Joseph that's Jesus's dad, okay? This is a different Joseph. It's likely that Jesus's uh, earthly father has already passed away by this point. This is Joseph of Arimathea, and we know him to be a significant, influential, wealthy, religious leader of the day, Okay? So we'll come back to him in just a minute. So Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate, that was the Roman governor at the time, for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. Did you catch that? That he was a follower of Jesus, but only in secret because he didn't want to be found out. With Pilate's permission, Joseph came and took the body of Jesus away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus. Everybody say Nicodemus. The man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. We saw, we met Jesus, uh, we met Nicodemus in chapter three of the book of John. Uh, It was a Nick at night moment, right? Do you remember that? Uh, Nicodemus, that was a stupid joke, but Nicodemus, (laughs) he went to see Jesus at night in secret because identifying himself with Jesus would have gone completely against all of the Jewish leaders of the day. And so this moment of identifying himself with Jesus out in public right now is the moment where his relationship with Jesus went from secret to public. Um, And it was significant in that way. And so Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Now this was according to tradition. This was, was how they would help embalm and take care of the body as it was being buried. Taking Jesus's body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. And at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb in which, one had ev- in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. First two people that we encounter at the death of Jesus is Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And these two men encountered the, 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 the crucified Christ and sacrificed much in their obedience and their desire to follow Jesus. So Joseph of Arimathea, uh, let, me, let me nerd out in scripture with you for a little bit. Joseph of Arimathea requests the body of Jesus. Now, typically when you would request the body of a criminal who has just been crucified, uh, family members would not be punished for requesting that body. But for a member of the elite, of the religious elite to request the body, however, it would have required significant risk. It was likely that Joseph of Arimathea upon identifying himself with Jesus in public would have lost his entire career. Everything that he had given and devoted his life to, he would have lost it in this moment. And for Nicodemus to come out of the nighttime into the daytime to identify himself with Jesus as well and to not only identify himself with Jesus but to also give an offering of 75 pounds of, of spices and, of, and, of, and of, of pieces here to help embalm and prepare Jesus's body for burial. This was a significant sacrifice from wealthy religious elite people. And yet the crucifixion of Jesus changed something in them. Now, what's significant about this moment with Nicodemus and with Joseph is a tomb is located nearby. Now, uh, I'm, can I geek out with you for a little bit on this? Is this okay? Are you with me? Everybody say yes, Drew. 
Okay, uh, this tomb nearby where Jesus was buried, uh, according to another biography of Jesus, one of the other gospels, this tomb actually belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. Now, for Joseph of Arimathea to give this tomb to Jesus, it was likely that Joseph set this tomb aside to be a family tomb, to ultimately help bury family members in the future. Now, I don't, you know, in 2023, if you've ever done some last will and testament, end of life preparation and stuff like that, there's nothing cheap about burial plots, is there? That was the case 2,000 years ago too. There was nothing cheap about Joseph of Arimathea owning this, this, this grave, this tomb. And for him to say, I'll allow Jesus to be buried him, uh, buried here, would have likely omitted his entire family from being buried there, which would have totally voided this tomb that he had planned to use for his end of life stuff. This was a gift that Joseph gave to Jesus out of obedience and as an act of worship. He gave this to Jesus to be buried in. It's fascinating and it, it requires much sacrifice. But my favorite point of, of, of this early few verses here is this guy, Nicodemus. Like Nicodemus was the one who went to talk to Jesus in John chapter three by, at, at night so he wouldn't get found out. And he begins to ask questions of Jesus like, like who is it that you say that you are? What is different about you than any other prophet? And it's in this exchange that Jesus has with Nicodemus that this beautiful verse comes out for you and for me. Jesus says to Nicodemus, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That was in a conversation with this man. And out of that place, Nicodemus did not feel like he could go public with his faith in Jesus. And so over time, in private, in secret, this faith begins to develop in Nicodemus up until the crucifixion of Jesus, and he decides to stand out in public, be identified with Jesus, and say, this man is who he says he is. He is the Christ. Now, what's significant about this Friday, okay, that's that, that the Jesus has just given his life is that there's a big Jewish holiday happening right around this time. Did you know this? What Jewish holiday is happening right here as Jesus has just given his life? Help me out. What Jewish holiday? Passover. And so for a religious leader, uh, let me, a devout Jewish follower to touch a dead body, do you know what that would have done to them? as a result of being able to step into temples or places of worship, do you know what that would have required then? It requires seven, day of cleansing, seven days of cleansing yourself after touching this dead body. So Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea both sacrificed this Jewish holiday, being able to participate in this Jewish holiday so that they could devote themselves in obedience and an act of worship of taking care of the body of Jesus. Isn't this a crazy? Easy sacrifice from them? Like, are you getting the weight of this moment that these influential, wealthy people would step out of the darkness, would step out of hiding, step into the light and say, yes, Jesus is the Christ. He is my Messiah. And I wonder if we have some folks in the room who are wealthy or influential, just like Nicodemus or Joseph, where your faith has been cultivated in the deep hidden places, in the secret moments, and the only place that you've publicly identified yourself with Jesus is the fact that you show up at church. What if the way that God may be inviting you to step out in faith and in public with your declaration that Jesus is the Messiah is that you would meet me in the water today and say, yes, Jesus is my Christ. He is the Messiah. Maybe that's you. The text continues. Let's uh, go to chapter 20. Let's go to verse one. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary, everybody say Mary. Mary Magdalene. So this was a, not the mother of Jesus. Lots of Marys, lots of Josephs, lots of people to keep track of, okay? So 
So Mary Magdalene was one of the early followers of Jesus. She was freed from addiction, freed from uh, literally a demon possession by Jesus. And she was one of the first early followers of Jesus. She likely traveled around with the disciples as they ministered. And so Mary was the first to the tomb on Sunday, Sunday morning. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw, listen, that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this story, the tomb that Jesus was laid in, they laid a large stone over the front of it to prevent anything from in there from getting out. Because the enemies of Jesus, the Romans at the time, remembered Jesus' claim that after three days, he would rise from the grave. And so they're like, we're not risking anything wonky happening here, all right? We're not risking somebody trying to steal his body or trying to make this moment what it isn't, and so we're gonna lay this tomb or this stone over the top of it. So Mary shows up on Sunday. Saturday was their Sabbath, so they weren't allowed to do any work. She shows up Sunday morning to finish up the rest of the burial custom for Jesus, and she sees that the stone is removed. Now, picture yourself in Mary's shoes. You have given your entire life to follow this Jesus, this carpenter from Nazareth. He dies on a cross. This moment of extreme shame has to have been complete heartbreak for Mary. And she goes to pay her honor and pay her worship and pay her respect to Jesus. And she sees that the stone is rolled away. What comes to your mind? I'm like, what is going on? Like, where did the stone go? Who moved the stone? What is happening? So she came, uh, the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that's John. Everybody say John. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. It seems, uh, allow me to just speculate for a little bit. It seems that the only people that remember Jesus' claim that he would rise from the grave are his enemies. His closest followers are like, someone took him. Like, I don't know where they took him. He gone. I don't know where he is. (laughs) And it's like, did you just forget? Like Jesus' conversation with you where he says, tear this temple down and in three days I will raise it again. That they just forget this moment that he really is the Christ? Like, did they just forget? I don't know. I I probably would have been the same way. Now, what's significant about this moment that Mary Magdalene and the other biographies, other gospels noted that other women were at the tomb there first too, is the way that God honors these women to be the very first ones that share the reality that the tomb is empty. Do you know the gift of this moment for women at the time? Like, according to religious law back then, rabbis, religious leaders used to say this, it is better that the words of the law be burned than be delivered to a woman. They did not think well of women back then. And so for the fact that Jesus would allow, God in his sovereignty would allow women to be the first ones to proclaim that the tomb is empty, how good is God? So Peter and John, in their own curious way, they were, they were wondering what just happened. And so let's read this verse three and we'll finish up the text. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. That's John. So Peter and John take off. They're like, Mary shows up. She says, someone took him. Peter and John go, that's not good. So they take off for the tomb themselves. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now I gotta pause. I I have to think that like as Peter is reading this later from John, uh, like, really John, you had to put in there? And she were faster than me? (laughs) Author's rights. Sorry, like I'm the writer here, so I get to do it. (laughs) So John gets there first. I love this, I love his style. John gets there first. John bent over and he looked in to the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. He looks in the tomb and realizes that the strips of linen are lying there. He's shocked. The stone was rolled away, not so that Jesus could get out, but that others could see in. So that others could see the reality that the tomb is empty. Jesus didn't need to roll the stone away. I mean, he, he is fully God. Like he didn't need to roll the stone away. The stone was rolled away so that others could see the reality that the tomb is empty. 
John sees this for the first time. Then Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. Classic Peter. He's like, get out of the way, I'm coming in. And he gets in the tomb and he see the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first gets that jab in there again. Also went inside. He saw and, what's the word here? Believed. One of the things they note there is that the linens were neatly folded. Neatly folded. I don't know what's significant about that moment. Maybe it's for us men in the room that if Jesus can fold laundry, we can too. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> too far, I don't, maybe. <laughs> but I have to think that the significance of that moment, listen, is that there, if there were actually thieves taking the body of Jesus, that they would have not neatly folded the linens with which Jesus was placed around. Like, I don't know if you've ever been the, the, the victim, the, the, uh, a horrible victim of, of robbing or someone taking something from you, but typically those thieves are not keen on making things look better than when they last found it, right? And so we have to see here that there's something more happening. And John saw it, and he believed. Scripture goes on to say they still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They still didn't get it. So then the disciples went back to where they were staying. What happened to Jesus? The resurrection changes everything. And for Peter and for John and for Mary and for Joseph and for Nicodemus and for those early followers of Jesus, all the way up to today, 2,000 years later, we can now look into the empty tomb as well through this text and see that the tomb is empty. And it means that Jesus is alive. And what does that mean for you and for me? The resurrection changes everything. It means we have a resurrected Savior who is alive and well, interceding on the right hand of God for you and for me. It means that we have a Savior who defeated death. And that tells me that even when death plagues us in our humanity, death does not get the final say-so because we serve a risen Savior who defeated and conquered death. Amen. The resurrection changes everything. It also means that whatever Jesus said in his life is true. Everything that he said was true. And I wish, friends, I wish I could take a vibrant family field trip with you and we could go right over to the empty tomb together. And even today, it's, it's, uh, it, it's debated on where the actual empty tomb was or the specific tomb with which Jesus was buried. But here's the truth. You and I aren't gonna find it and while we can't go there necessarily ourselves right now, we can certainly read this text and realize that the firsthand account from our friend John is true. And if the resurrection is true, that means anything is possible. That means it's now by the grace of God that we can be saved. And it's not based on our own works. It's not based on our own merit, but it's based on his. It means, listen, friend, that the resurrection story of Jesus can be your story too. That Jesus' resurrection story can be your story too. Friend, Jesus paid for your resurrection. He gave his life so on a cross so that our mistakes and our sin would no longer separate us from a holy God and we can now approach the throne of grace in confidence of the gift of salvation that Jesus has given us. And we can find that we have a risen Savior who is, who is working on our behalf, who is interceding for you and for me and is inviting us to now identify ourselves with him too. And the way that we love to do this is this gift of baptism. Now, I've gotten a couple of notes this week. I got, we've got some friends that are coming to Vibrant right now that are fresh within the last uh, few months. And they're like, I've, I don't have any idea what baptism even means. Like, what is baptism? I don't know if I've ever seen one before. Baptism is identifying yourself with Jesus. So what we do, and you'll, you're going to see this happen in just a moment, is we're going we're gonna to walk into this pool. And, um, and what I'm going to do is I'll have you take your confession of faith with me. It says, I believe that Jesus is the Christ the son of the living God, my Lord and Savior. And then what I do is I'll say, upon your confession of faith, 
I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what, what I'll do is I'll take you under the water, but then I'll bring you back up out of the water. And what we say in that is that you are buried with Christ and raised with him to walk a new life. Baptism is a gift that, that God has given us to identify him, ourselves with him. Like it's, like, it's like putting on the jersey and getting into the game. Like it's, it's coming out of hiding in that secret place of, of your faith in Jesus and saying, I'm going all in. So what is baptism? Baptism is aligning ourselves with the resurrection story with Jesus. Uh, also, why, why, why do we get baptized? Jesus told us to do it. Like if, if Jesus told us to do it, the one who like came back from death, hell, and the grave, I'm gonna do it. Like if, if Jesus told me to do it, that's enough. Like I'm gonna do it. Um, additionally, Jesus was baptized himself. Did you know this? That Jesus was baptized and in his baptism, there was a moment as he was coming out of the water where the voice of God, it's beautifully illustrated in the, in the biographies of Jesus where it says, God says, this is my son whom I love and in him I am well pleased. It's this beautiful gift of affirmation that you and I are sons and daughters of the king. That's what baptism is. Uh, let's, let's just keep working through some of these practical questions. What does baptism do? Baptism identifies yourself with Jesus. Like it, it's a step of stepping out of a private faith and into a public space of faith, meaning I now want to identify myself with Jesus. It identifies itself. It, it goes public with what God is doing in your heart and your mind and in your spirit. It's going all in, in public and in faith with that decision to follow Jesus. A uh, question that often comes up in this conversation about baptism is, what if I was sprinkled as a baby? And that's a great question. And I, I first off wanna celebrate the reality that if you were sprinkled as a baby, you have guardians or parents that so desire for you to know the Lord and that they wanted to devote you to the Lord. And we praise God for that. Additionally, we are often aligned and see ourselves on the same team with any church that says Jesus is the Christ. We are all in with those friends. But what we see to be true in scripture is that when someone says yes to following Jesus, it's a personal decision, and then it's a choice on the spot to be buried and raised to new life. And so if you have been sprinkled as a baby, this is a great way for you to continue that desire from your guardians or your parents to say, yes, I wanna identify myself with Jesus. I'd love to see you in the water. I was, I was raised in the Methodist faith tradition and I was sprinkled as a baby. And, and upon the, my own reading and just seeing what Jesus invites us to do, I celebrate my parents' decision for, to, to dedicate and sprinkle me as a baby, but I was also baptized, immersed. Uh, I was nine. I was nine years old. Hello. Uh, going all in with Jesus. What's the next question we have, Jeremy? Help me out. What if I didn't bring a change of clothes? That's a great question because this pool is very wet, right? Like it's not fake water in there. Uh, <laughs> and even like, even asking our team to put this pool in here, they thought I was crazy. They're like, we're doing what? Like our grounds team and building team was like, what if it leaks? And I'm like, I know, like this could be crazy, right? So what if I didn't bring a change of clothes? Um, if you didn't bring a change of clothes, we've got them. Uh, we've, got a, we've got shirts in the back. We've got uh, socks in the back. We've got a ton of towels. Like we bought extra towels this week. Um, like we are prepared and ready for you to get in. Um, but for some of you, like I, I'm wondering if you're just gonna be, need to get in the water just like me um, and just decide to go home wet. And so I'm just gonna get in the water just as I am right now and uh, decide to go home wet. Like, that's what we see in scripture. Like, there's a moment where, uh, in Acts, where this man gives his life to Jesus, and he's like, well, what do I what do, I do about baptism here? And um, I hope it's not cold. Uh, <laughs> ooh, no, it's not. It feels great. But he says, what do I, what do I, what do I, uh, I mean, there's water. Should I be baptized? And he says, yeah, let, and he was baptized on the spot right there. And so if you didn't bring a change of clothes, uh, me neither. Um, let's go home wet, huh? Um, I would love to see you right here in the water with me. What other questions do we have, Jeremy? I don't know where to go. <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, my team, our team is prepared to help you along that line. And so what we're going to do, I'm going to continue with some of these questions and we're going to pray for you. 
But I'm gonna count to three. And then on the count of three, if you are ready to spontaneously say, yes, I wanna identify myself with Jesus, you're actually gonna walk around the back of the room and then along this wall over here on your right. And there's my buddy, Carl. Everybody say, hey, Carl. <laughs> Carl's ready to greet you over there and help you along your way. And we'll help you figure it out as, as we go. What if my family isn't here to see it? I think that's a great question. What if my family isn't here to see it? Um, we have all of this on video. Uh, it's, it's literally going on YouTube right now. And we've got professional photographers. We've got the team here. Um, would we love for your family to be here? Absolutely. But will they be thrilled for the reality that you've decided to be baptized today? Absolutely. Like the time is now, friends. So let's jump in. What else do we got? What if I'm afraid of water? That's a legit question, okay? Um, if you're afraid of water, uh, we'll take good care of you. Like I'm, I'm gonna be right here, okay? We'll have some team members here along the stairs as well. Like we're gonna make sure you're just fine. We'll take our time in the water too. Um, but uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. The water feels great. Um, I won't keep you under too long, all right? Uh, <laughs> but we, we'd, we'd love to just kind of slowly walk through that with you. And um, if you are under the age of 18, we're gonna ask for parent permission. Um, if you're fifth grade or younger, we're gonna ask for parent permission, maybe even a conversation with one of our kids' men's team as well. But anyone is welcome to jump in today. What else do we have? What about my kids in kids ministry? If you've got kids checked into kids ministry, the line gets long and you're like, I don't know if I can wait that long. They're gonna be just fine, all right? They got like a ton of goldfish back there. Like <laughs> they're gonna make sure you're fine. We've actually uh, encouraged the team, hey, service may run a little longer today based on uh, people getting baptized and whatever, whatever you need, like the, the kid, our kids ministry team's got them and they'll take good care of your kids. Next question, what if I don't feel worthy? I think that's the question that most often comes up. It's like, I don't feel worthy to identify myself with Jesus. And my response would be, me too. Like, I don't feel like I'm worthy to be doing what I'm doing. And yet, it's Jesus that qualifies and equips me to do what I do. And he invites me to the table just as I am. And he continues to spur me on and encourage me forward. And there was a pastor, someone sent me a link this past week and it's a pastor that talked about uh, the criminal that was crucified next to Jesus. Are you familiar with this part of the crucifixion story? It wasn't covered in John's narrative, but it was covered in another one of the gospels where there's a criminal being cru crucified next to Jesus. And he says, Lord, help me. And he, Jesus responds, today I will be with you in paradise. Can you imagine the moment where that criminal shows up in heaven? And I don't know if there's a bouncer or someone like right there at the front of the pearly gates and, uh, and looks, at the, looks at the man on the, 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 the thief on the cross and says, well, what are you doing here? And uh, he said, well, there was this guy that said, I'll see you in paradise. And so here I am. Well, do you understand the doctrines of sanctification? Have you read the scriptures with which we understand how we are to be saved? And I see him looking at the bouncer and going, uh, what? <laughs> like, I was a guy that I gave my life to and he said, I'll see you in paradise. And so the bouncer says, well, let me call my manager and figure out what's going on here. And so he comes over and the, the, the manager looks over at him and says, who said that you could come here? And the criminal simply replies, the man in the middle told me that I could come. And the only qualifier, friend, for you to be identified with Jesus is simply Jesus. So if you don't feel worthy, welcome to the table. Welcome to the club. But it's Jesus that calls us. It's Jesus that identifies us. And it's Jesus that says we are worthy. Amen. You don't have to have this whole thing figured out. You don't have to understand how the resurrection works or how the crucifixion happened. You don't have to have any of this figured out. You don't have to understand how your sins are forgiven. You don't have to understand how you've been qualified and made worthy by the blood of the lamb. We don't have to understand all of it, but we do have to say yes to Jesus. And so this is an invitation, friend, for you to go all in with Jesus and to be identified with him. Would you stand with me? I'm gonna pray. And after my prayer, I'm gonna count to three. And if you're one of those that needs to be in the water, I'll meet you right here. I would love to see you in the water. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful for your resurrection. 
We're grateful for the life that it gives us. We're grateful for the hope that we now have because of it. We're grateful for the joy with which we now find our lives. And so, God, I know, I know that I am not worthy, and yet you invite me to be worthy because of your son. And so, Lord, as we're now obedient to your commission out of Matthew 28 to baptize and to make disciples, Lord, would you find us to be courageous and to say, yes, I'll be baptized. And if we have any friends in the room or friends online that have never made that decision, Lord, may you encourage and invite them now to the water, Lord. May it be so. We'll trust you with whatever may come and we'll say, thank you, Lord, for the resurrection. Thank you, Lord, for the empty grave. Thank you, Lord, for the life of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of grace and truth. And thank you, Lord, for saving a sinner like me. And thank you, Lord, for saving us to look more like you, Lord. We'll follow you, we'll be obedient to you, and we'll trust you in Jesus' name. And we all said together, amen. Hey, the